Cointelegraph reporter Turner Wright recently interviewed presidential candidate Brock Pierce about his ongoing campaign. Pierce is a former child actor known for his roles in The Mighty Ducks and First Kid. He is also a former director of the Bitcoin Foundation and a co-founder of Block One, Tether USDT, and Blockchain Capital. In 1998, Pierce established Digital Entertainment Network with partners Mark Collins Rector and Chad Shackley. Two years later, three former DEN employees filed lawsuits against Pierce, alleging that he provided them with drugs and pressured them for underage sex. The Hollywood Reporter stated that these allegations against Pierce were later recanted, with one plaintiff convicted of fraud and two witnesses testifying that they had been offered payment to provide false testimony. Shackley, Collins, Rector, and Pierce left for Spain in 2000 to start internet gaming entertainment. They were arrested at their Marbella home by Interpol in 2002, where police found thousands of images of child pornography. Pierce denied awareness of these images. While Pierce and Shackley were quickly released, Collins Rector was extradited back to the US in 2004 and found guilty of five counts of transporting minors for sex. Despite Pierce's repeated denial of criminal involvement, the story has followed him into his crypto ventures. He was elected director of the Bitcoin Foundation in May 2014, but several members resigned, reportedly over concerns about Pierce. He was also one of the co-founders of Block One, but after a segment mentioning the Den allegations aired on John Oliver's Last Week Tonight, the firm announced Pierce would be stepping down. Pierce first announced his candidacy for US president in a July 5th tweet, stating he would run as an independent. Singer and entrepreneur Akon recently joined Pierce's campaign team as its chief strategist. After four attempts, we finally managed to track down Pierce for the interview. Take a look. Hi, my name is Turner Wright with Cointelegraph, and I'm going to be speaking with Brock Pierce. Well, yeah, let's just jump right into it. Uh, I've prepared in every way I can by watching The Mighty Ducks like 70 times. I'm afraid I'm not a fan of Sidbad, so no first kid for me. Sorry about that. But uh, let's focus on your president shortly. What would you, as president, uh, what would you do to help make crypto more mainstream to foster mass adoption? Well, I'm not sure it's the, uh, <laughs> the president's uh, uh, job to promote cryptocurrency. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, the thing that I think is most relevant from a, well, there's two things that the government uh, is doing or has a role to play in this. One is, is clearly regulators. Um, our regulators have created an unpleasant environment where entrepreneurs uh, and innovation is leaving the country. Um, you know, the U.S. historically has been the capital of innovation and that, that status is at risk. Uh, our regulators are stifling innovation by creating a um, an ambiguous sort of environment rather than a clear uh, sandbox in which to innovate. I mean, we, I mean, most of the people that I see, you know, as someone that uh, you know has historically been an investor, uh, a mentor, uh, a founder, advisor, etc. You know, a lot of startups have been moving to Europe. A lot of startups have been moving to Asia. A lot of startups have been moving to, to Latin America. And other than, the, uh, other than Wyoming, Wyoming has is, is clearly become the capital of our industry in the U.S., uh, which is really amazing to see. That Who would have thought Wyoming, of all places, would become the main jurisdiction that everyone in the blockchain space, this is where everyone incorporates today, uh, which does go to show how quickly um, things can turn around. Um, you know, if, if, if I had been asked a couple of years ago, what were the odds that Wyoming would be, uh, the, the state leading, uh, our industry, I would have said, uh, you know, I, I would have said as close to 0% as I could get. <laughs> um, I, I, you would have had a very hard time convincing me that Wyoming would be leading the charge and it would be where probably 90% of all innovative companies in this field are incorporating. I mean, I, I would have thought that would be, it would have been inconceivable to me, but uh, it does go to show that with, uh, with good leadership, forward thinking leadership with visionary leadership, uh, you know, great things can happen. And so um, I'd say one thing the U S needs to do is make sure that regulators are doing their jobs which is to protect, you know, consumers and prevent, you know, whatever uh, uh, bad activities that they are there to prevent. Um, but clearly, 
uh, it's not to move innovation outside of the country. We're living through the fourth industrial revolution and there will be winners and there will be losers. And it's America's to lose. And, um, you know, uh, that's one half of it. The other piece is the, uh, is the U.S. dollar. You know, having been one of the founders of Tether, I think that that's uh, uh, clearly it's having a big impact in the world right now in terms of governments learning from that experiment and seeing ways to uh, technology enable their currency. You know, Tether is doing 10 to $15 trillion a year of transactional volume. Those are big numbers. Um, those are very real numbers. You know, Tether uh, might be uh, the most important innovation around fiat currency, you know, since the advent of fiat currency, it's clearly one of them. And governments around the world have started piloting projects, seeing uh, how technology could enhance their currencies. And China in particular, with the, the Digital One project that is built off of the Tether framework, um, you know, is, uh, you know, potentially going to threat, threaten the U.S. dollar's world reserve status. That's relevant, you know, that's relevant to our government. Of course, you're right when it comes to the regulators, uh, but things that there, there are like the, um, let's talk about things a little more within your purview. You recently tweeted about solutions to save the post office, even though it is uh, kind of this old school, it's, it's not something we think about when we think of technological innovation. Uh, but are you in favor of bailing out the post office rate? No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's a good question. Obviously, the post office has uh, uh, played a very important role in uh, enabling Americans to communicate. Email clearly uh, uh, has had a huge impact on our basic you know, ability to communicate and certainly made it much faster and more efficient and cost effective, right? Um, you know, the question is, what is the role for the, you know, the post office going forward? Uh, there's still a lot of Americans that rely on uh, low cost mail, which, uh, you know, a stamp. Uh, and there is still the need to, uh, we still rely on uh, paper, paper ballots, for example. Uh, you know, uh, you know, will there be, will USPS be around in 50 years? Will there be any need for it? Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 my guess is no. Uh, you know, I would hope by 2024, we've figured out how to uh, enable blockchain-based voting, for example. You know, there's five states in the U.S. that are currently testing blockchain-based voting. You know, and then the question is, you know, is this an area where the government still needs to be involved, uh, considering that we have FedEx and U, uh, UPS and, you know, uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer on uh, what the right answer is. Clearly, it's a hot topic right now because we're seeing mailboxes disappearing. <laughs> uh, really interesting photos. Uh, the timing uh, for their disappearance is, is suspect. Um, clearly, uh, People are talking about this as a, is, is, is this being done as a way to suppress the vote? Um, you know, some might argue that this is a, uh, being done to protect the, uh, uh, protect us from fraudulent voting. You have referenced 2024 a number of times rather than just focusing on this year's campaign. And I ask this as a completely serious question. Don't take offense to it. But do you intend to win or do you just want to make a statement? Other than by an act of God, uh, I don't think there is any way to win in 2020. Though, you don't have to win to become president. You don't have to win the election to become president. This is something that most people don't understand. And when I talk to like the top sort of political strategists, advisors, and people, you know, they're, they're like, what? You know, I'm like, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a gamer. I study the rules. Uh, uh, and I study history. <laughs> and when you actually understand the rules of our election and you study history, you will become aware of a couple of things. So uh, first of all, you don't need to win the election to become president. So the way that our general election works 
is it runs off. It, you need to, to win the election. You need to win a majority, the key word being majority, of the electoral college vote. A majority. So in a two-party race, what happens if there were a tie? So there's 538 electoral college votes. You need 270 or more to win. If there was a tie, it would be 269 to 269, meaning no one got a majority. This is what happened in the HBO show Veep season five. It's also what happened in the year 1800, Thomas Jefferson versus Aaron Burr. Now, if a third party, such as myself, were to win a single state, it becomes possible that no one wins the election. If a third party, such as again, ourselves, were to win three states, it becomes likely that no one wins the election. So I'm not trying to win the election. I'm trying to win three states so that no one wins the election. Yeah. Why, why would you want no one to win the election? Okay. The question I had intended, uh, intended despite winning, would you want to be president or is this just intended as a burn the system approach? Uh, no, no, I'm, I, I am running with a strategy to end up in the white house in January. And I'm laying the groundwork, I'm laying the foundation to build, uh, to build a coalition across the country to rebirth the Independence Party. In 2022, it is our intentions to run 100 independent candidates up and down the ticket throughout the country, local, state, federal elections. And I intend to run in 2024, again, as an independent with the objective of winning the election. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some of the people you might have in your campaign. Uh, we've learned about a few on the Democratic ticket this week, as well as Republicans. But you've previously had a former advisor to Trump, Steve Bannon, who you called your right-hand man for seven years. Is he helping at all to strategize? No, uh, I didn't involve Steve in any way whatsoever. Um, though he could have been very useful. Um, uh, uh, Steve and I worked together in my 20s back in the mid 2000s. And uh, uh, I'm running as an independent candidate. And, uh, you know, Steve obviously is uh, uh, core to the Trump campaign. Uh, wouldn't have been a uh, I'm not sure he would have been willing or interested, uh, 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 nor would it have been appropriate, I think, for this campaign. Inappropriate now? I mean, if he were available, rather, would you still think he would be a person you would want on your campaign? Well, he's, uh, I think he's busy um, with China principally right now. And it was my understanding that Trump... Uh, uh, was asking him to come on as CEO of the Trump campaign. And so uh, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, and so I can't even give you a, a good answer because I haven't been in communications with him. No, no. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what role he's playing in the current election. No, no, I mean, and, I'm, and I'm certain he's playing a role of some sort. I was speaking purely hypothetically. If it's like he has no obligations, he's out there, would he be the kind of person you would want on your campaign? I mean, he's a, he's a brilliant political strategist, and um, uh, a number of people would argue that he was responsible for, for Trump getting elected. Certainly, he played a, a, a role in that. Uh, I think most people would agree a substantial role. Um, and so uh, uh, the answer is, yeah, conceivably, as long as I had uh, you know, someone similar from the left. Uh, I try to do everything in a very balanced fashion. And, and, and I, I don't know what Steve's opinion is on uh, uh, third parties, right? He's uh, presently aligned with the, uh, uh, with the Republican Party. I'm uh, uh, very focused on a political revolution, a political rise to, uh, uh, to rise above partisan politics. So uh, uh, I, I don't know what Steve's opinion is. Uh, you know, I can give you hypothetical opinions based upon if Steve thought this, this, and that, but you have to go through sort of a tree of questions. I actually don't know where Steve stands on this stuff because I've not consulted him or asked him. 
Well, no, that was not the angle. It was general temperament. So I was thinking. Um, so well, I believe that we should uh, carry. You know, we should uh, aspire to be as graceful in life as we possibly can. Um, you know, uh, I'm not perfect, nor are any of us. But uh, you know, I aspire to carry myself uh, with grace. Uh, do you have any regrets from your life? Regrets? Um, I'm not sure that the word regret is the word that I would use. Uh, I've made mistakes, lots of mistakes. Uh, I take responsibility for the mistakes that I make, and I try to learn lessons from them so as not to repeat you know, those mistakes. I mean, life is... is a, Life wouldn't be very interesting if we didn't make mistakes. You know, it's part of part of part of the process. And so, uh, you know, I'm happy with the person that I am today. I feel like I'm doing lots of good things in the world, helping lots of people, making the world a better place. You know, I believe in, you know, make. I'm. I believe I'm making a positive impact, and I think uh, there's a fair amount of evidence to support that. So you've described some of what I'm talking about as an old narrative that people uh, can't get beyond certain aspects of your life. Um, but it was reported several years ago during your time with Den that you paid $21,000 in settlements regarding allegations of sexual assault. Are you concerned at all that those previous allegations, despite you calling them an old narrative, um, are going to affect your presidential vote? What, what do you mean by a few years ago? Several years ago. When I was 16 and 17? Correct. So 20, um, you know, 24 years ago. Um, <laughs> this is back in 1997, 1998, 1999. Um, uh, uh, I never gave anyone a settlement. So I think your information is incorrect. Uh, there was uh, all of that stemmed from a single lawsuit and all three of the plaintiffs apologized and admitted that nothing ever happened. And they were sorry and they dismissed their first two cases. The third plaintiff, the lawyer refused to file the paperwork to dismiss the case without getting his expenses paid. And the third plaintiff who apologized in front of many witnesses and said that none of these things ever happened, couldn't get the lawyer to file the paperwork. And so I paid his lawyer's out of pocket expenses to dismiss the case. I wouldn't call that a settlement. Legal fees and whatnot? No, not legal fees. Court filing fees, gas, you know, out of pocket expenses. Uh, legal fees normally would be in the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, depending upon the case. But uh, one of your party did, in fact, plead guilty, Mark Collins Richter. Do you still have any connections with him? No, of course not. <laughs> He was my business partner when I was 16, 17, and 18. Well, so going uh, a little bit back to the crypto space and just about some of your goals, some, um, let's combine the definition of win versus being in the White House. Public figures like uh, Matty Greenspan have called your campaign having a snowball's chance in the Mojave Desert. Uh, what do you say to something like that, even assuming he's thinking of winning in the traditional sense? But assuming he said snowball's hands in the Mojave has desert to get into the White House. I've told you my strategy. Okay. It's pretty clear. Um, All right. What, uh, what kind of temperament and character would you believe you would carry forward as president? Because obviously we're leaving a very contentious president behind in terms of the post office, just the most recent example. But how would you carry yourself? Well, probably the same way that I carry myself in life. You know, you try to do that with treating people with dignity, respect, facilitate conversation, bring opposing parties to the table, make sure that everybody's voices are heard, to have vision, to inspire, to educate, you know, find a path forward. All right, fair enough. Uh, and one of the other uh, 
one of the other issues we've been talking about, uh, you stated the mental health issue is still very real. That was one of your tweets a while ago. Um, I'm not sure if you said any any interviews, I apologize. But what are your thoughts on Kanye's presidential bid and run um, as he is technically the competition? Well, I'm not running against Kanye. (laughs) I'm running with uh, Kanye. I'm a big supporter of anyone uh, running as a third party candidate. And, uh, you know, hopefully Kanye is inspiring lots of people into recognizing that they may have a future in politics. You know, we need more people with a diverse background represented in government. And so I hope that Kanye's running helps people recognize that maybe they could be on their local city council. Maybe they could be mayor one day. You know, I think we need more entrepreneurs, more computer scientists, more engineers, more business owners, more farmers. I think we need a government that is more representative of the people. All right. Brock Pierce, thank you for speaking with me today. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.